And grace and peace be yours in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you well know, this past week was the 4th of July. We're going to look at our Old Testament lesson as well, but I can't help but frame it in the context of our national holiday. And of course, to tell you that my family loves the 4th of July. We love to celebrate our nation and God's blessings uh, to us as a people. And we also do love fireworks. Uh, for many years at the neighborhood we live in, lots of neighbors have set off their own fireworks on front of their own house. We live in an HOA community. And on Facebook, somebody said, how about if instead of a dozen places, we all gather together at the pool house and never bring all of their uh, fireworks together. And it was really awesome. Uh, the fireworks were beautiful. At home that afternoon, Renee had smoked ribs and chicken. It was delightful. Uh, so much to celebrate. Uh, but we were doing the fireworks down at the pool house and uh, just partway through that, a police car pulled up. And uh, isn't that always a funny thing? Whenever the police show up, you feel what? You kind of feel that little, you know, stricken feeling. If you're driving your car and there's a cop behind you, you start to freeze up like, am I speeding? Uh, and here's the question is, are fireworks illegal in South Carolina? They're not, but somehow the cop showed up. And that goes to show you, by the way, the theological point that the law does convict, right? So we weren't doing anything wrong, but the police showed up and everybody's like, uh-oh. Um, and he was just checking on us, making sure nobody was doing anything crazy. And we weren't. And uh, so it was, I'll remember that he said, uh, he just checked on us. And then he said these very words, keep blowing stuff up. <laughs> and that reminded me that I live in South Carolina now. Uh, we used to live in Connecticut and the fireworks we were shooting off this past week were illegal in Connecticut. Uh, but in South Carolina, the police told us to keep blowing it up. So that was a delightful thing. I, I want to start with that idea that we love the 4th of July. Uh, we love to be patriotic and we love our country. Uh, but national holidays have become kind of weird lately, right? And I don't want to be naive and not notice this. We are a blessed people. And at the same time, we are concerned about the direction of our country. You cannot say, I love being an American and not pause and think about where we have arrived as a people. I couldn't help but thinking that with the Old Testament week, uh, Old Testament lesson this week being Ezekiel chapter two. And you've heard me say before, you need to hear me say it again. Whenever you read the Old Testament, you don't apply it directly, right? Um, you aren't Ezekiel, I'm not Ezekiel. Ezekiel is an Israelite. He's living in the sixth century BC. He is an exile to Babylon. All those things are different. It's not, his call is not exactly our call, but I do want us to look in on this text because there are some similarities. The first one is this, Ezekiel is an Israelite called to minister to Israel. And that means he's dealing with a historic people of God. As America once followed God, that is us. But like Ezekiel, that Israel is a people that have walked away from God. And we have, as a nation, walked away from God. We celebrate our country, but we notice that we've departed. And Israel, like us, are suffering the consequences of those actions. So I want us to listen in. Again, it's not directly to us, but I want us to listen in to what God has to say to his prophet. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 1, the very first thing he says is, Son of man, stand up on your feet. Now this chapter starts at the end of the prior chapter. You might say, why does it say, stand up on your feet? And the reason is because Ezekiel is flat on the ground on his face. And he's on the ground because Ezekiel chapter 1 is a vision of God. I want us to start there. 
church, we have to have a vision of our God and who he is, what he's like and what he does. We have a message, but we have to start at seeing God. Ezekiel 1 is kind of full of somewhat fantastic visions of heaven and angels and what that looks like. And then he sees and almost describes God and his awareness of who God is. He falls to the ground and worships. I've said this before, I'll say it here again. The church is not a country club. The church was not formed just to make America a better nation. That's not it. The church has a vision of God and more particularly as New Testament Christians have a vision of God in the face of Christ. You have to start there. And so God says to him, stand up. And verse 2 is delightful. He says, as he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. The Spirit. God said, stand up. Did Ezekiel stand up? No, he wasn't able. And why wasn't Ezekiel able? I think in his humanity, he had grown tired. And I want us to think about where we are as a people. The social changes in our nation have happened so fast. And not just fast, they're getting faster. About the time you've dealt with one issue, here's the next and the next. The Bible tells us that in God's design, marriage is a man and a woman. And the world has said, not so. And the word of God remains and says God's purpose, his plan, and his design for this is one man and one woman together. And having said that, I never would have thought in all my years of life that one of the most controversial verses in the Bible would become these words, male and female, he created them. That is woven into the fabric of the natural created order. And in our day, people have said, no. The Bible has not changed that view, nor have we. And I think this is what has happened. When a people depart from the will and the word of God, those who follow God grow weary. You've answered and spoken and you've actually been called names for saying what we've always said. And so God said, Ezekiel, stand up. And Ezekiel could not. But I do want us to get this. The Holy Spirit stood him up. And so church, we have to have a clear vision of our God and we have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're not going to do it in your own strength. Even Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. Because it's not your strength. That's just preliminary. And so God says to his Old Testament prophet, son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites. Well, that sounds good. But did you notice what comes after it? I'm sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation. And God goes on to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me. It sounds fun to say, well, if you're an Israelite prophet, you want to go to Israel. When I was a child, many of you probably had the same experience. I'll never forget when I was a child, I would sit in church. We often had missionaries come to speak. People from the mission field, they had traveled the world for the sake of the gospel. And very often those missionaries would say, is there anyone here that the Lord might call to the mission field? Ever hear that? And you think, am I willing to cross the globe to leave family and home and familiarity and to say, Lord, if you call, I'll go. The answer has to be what? has to be yes, I'm willing. But imagine this. 
You have to be willing to go, but I want you to know this, America is a mission field. Do you hear me? In the old days, we said you have to cross the ocean to do work in the mission field. Nowadays, you can walk out your front door and be in the mission field. You are in the mission field in America, and like Ezekiel, God has said to Ezekiel, I am sending you to the Israelites. When my parents lived in Virginia, one of their pastors for 20 years had served on the mission field. He had left home and country and culture and the familiar and traveled to the other side of the globe. But when his mission time ended, he moved from the mission field to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And he said, this is harder. You hear it? You have the hardness, the difficulty of talking to people who have already heard. But that's your call. Son of man, go to the Israelites. Next thing God says, and God will have more content later. For now, all he says is this. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I love the phrase. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Church, you are in a mission field. God is sending you with a message, but I want us to get this. The message is the word of God and nothing less. The message is not our personal opinions. In this election year, even less so, it is your politics. It's not our politics. The message is the word of God. It is not the word of men. It is not the opinion of men. Now, I do want to say this. I think the church has a wonderful message. You talk about it all the time. The message of the church, it's twofold. The first one is that the world has a sin problem. But the second answer is, the answer to the sin problem is a redeemer. God did not say the answer is self-help. The answer is not another self-help seminar. The answer is not get better. God has said you have a sin problem. The answer is my son. Isn't that wonderful? I, it's funny that people today critique the church. I think the message is positive. The message is Christ for sinners. We stick with that. That's not my message, by the way. And so we hear things today, criticisms of the church. I want to mention some, you've heard many more than this, but I just want to address a couple because I think they need to be addressed. The first one is this, people say Christians are judgmental. You've heard that one, right? Christians are judgmental. I want to say this, this church is not. I delight that as a congregation, you guys have a very strong idea that we stand here as redeemed sinners. Nobody thinks they're better than anyone. You get that you're here by grace and grace alone. I always want to say to people, if you think that the church is judgmental, you should find a different church. Sometimes people say Christians are cliquish. I don't think so. I love coming to church. You guys are receptive. You're warm and welcoming. That's what the church should be like. It should feel friendly and affirming. It's good to be in God's presence. I love this last one. People like to say Christians are boring. And I want to say, I don't know. My congregation is full of colorful characters. <laughs> Some of you have too much character. I want to say that. I always want to say, I won't name names, by the way. But you know who you are. If people think that Christians are boring, they should come to the next potluck, and I can sit them with certain people that will clear that right up. Now here's the thing. We have a beautiful message. The message is Christ for the world, God's free grace and forgiveness and renewal. What will the country do and the answer is, guess what? I don't know. Did you read Ezekiel's chapter 2? 
God has given his prophet a vision of God, has empowered by the Holy Spirit, has given him the word of God to proclaim. And verse 5 says, and whether they listen or fail to listen. Of course, God adds in, for they are a rebellious people. There's one thing, one thing I know about the future. I know that on the last day, the Lord Jesus will come again. That's what I know. I'm looking forward to the return of Christ. Between here and there, what else do I know? Not that much. I know we have a wonderful message. I know you've been called to deliver it. I know we live in a great country. And I know our country needs to return. Will it? I don't know. It's actually sort of thrilling in a way. I don't know what will happen. But God does add this. Whether they listen or fail to listen, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Isn't that great? I don't know whether people will listen or not, but I know that your job is to see the face of God, especially in Christ, to be empowered by his Holy Spirit, to speak the word of God, and I want to add this, to speak the word of God without accommodating it to the world. Right? We will not accommodate God's word to the world. It's the other way around. And to be faithful. When God said, at least they'll know that a prophet has been among them, I think the two-word summation of that is just these words, keep going. That's what it is. Keep going. You have a delightful message. What will the country do? I don't know. But I know that they need to know that you had been among them. Amen. And we stand together. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.